Well, joining me now from Tehran is Iranian affairs analyst Dr. Sayed Mustafa Hoshesham. In Athens, we have the author of Nuclear Iran, David Patrikarakos. And in Boston, Dr. Jim Walsh. He's a senior research associate at MIT's Security Studies Program. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Uh, Mustafa Hoshesham, let me start with you. As an Iranian watching things unfold in Singapore, does it annoy you? <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, no, it doesn't annoy us because uh, uh, denuclearization is a requirement of modern world. Uh, the, uh, the nuclear weapons that they declare the uh, nuclear weapons states uh, are endangering global peace and security. But the point is that the U.S. is not in talks with North Korea for the promotion of peace and security throughout the world. It's just looking uh, at, at it as a way to contain one of uh, its enemy states, uh, and it's trying to disarm North Korea uh, of uh, its uh, main power de uh, uh, deterrent power. Uh, we might feel a bit uh, concerned because as uh, we are watching these talks, we remember how the U.S. Uh, uh, treated us. The U.S. is no more trustworthy, especially after it undermined the non-proliferation treaty because of uh, its withdrawal from the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, that had been developed under the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, and it shows uh, that the U.S. Is, uh, n doesn't believe in the global values of the NPT. It only tries to impose uh, its own model on the NPT, that is to say, uh, the rest of the world should be disarmed and denuclearized, but uh, the established nuclear states, the five permanent UN Security Council members, plus India, Pakistan, and Israel, uh, are right. uh, not included by the okay. United States uh, pressures and efforts uh, at, at this, you know, uh, disarmament. We are worried that the U.S. might eventually, uh, you know, uh, uh, go for containing North Korea and then uh, they would withdraw from uh, the final deal and move on to, uh, you know, uh, regime change, okay. uh, uh, Pyongyang. Okay, understood. So, Jim Walsh, that's an interesting perspective because over the past day or so, everybody's been asking the question, can Trump, can the U.S., can the world trust Kim Jong-un? We've got a perspective from Tehran. Hold on, why should we trust the U.S.? Look at them, they pulled out of the Iran deal. That's a fair analysis, isn't it? Well, of course. And, you know, if you had asked me the question, are, are you frustrated or annoyed uh, as an Iranian, I would say the answer is yes. I mean, the president had a perfectly good nuclear agreement, the JCPOA. He ripped it up. And at least based on what we've seen coming out of Singapore so far, there's nothing even close, close to the Iranian nuclear agreement uh, that's been settled that uh, is has anything like the verification or or all the different parts of the JCPOA, what we got out of Singapore was some was a vague announcement. So if I was an Iranian, I'd be I'd be sort of angry at it all. Um, but as to the can you trust the U.S. Obviously, uh, I think that that was a question going into the North Korean meetings. Uh, you know, JCPOA or no JCPOA, because the U.S. and North Korea have had a tough history with each side accusing the other of not having followed through on its commitments. And so I'm sure for North Korea this was a big question. It's always a big question when you have a negotiation between two parties. One is bigger and stronger. One is weaker. How does the weaker party, in this case North Korea, how does the weaker party know that uh, it can right. trust the, the more powerful party to follow through on its promises? And I think that remi remains an open question. David Patrick Karakos. After what happened in Singapore, are we any closer to global denuclearization? Uh, well, many thanks for inviting me on as well. Uh, I mean, you know, the, quite simply, no. Uh, in answer to your earlier question, I think whether you're an Iranian or not an Iranian, you've got to be frustrated by the tearing up of the nuclear deal. I would take issue with the gentleman <laughs> in Iran, however, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the non-proliferation treaty is an avowedly asymmetric treaty. You know, it allows the nuclear weapon states to have nuclear weapons, though it does say that they should move towards denuclearization, and it says that no one else can
can have them. This is an avowedly asymmetric treaty, and it is important to remember that it is actually most enthusiastically supported by not the nuclear weapon states, but the non-nuclear weapon states, the Fijis, the Icelands, the Sudans, the Nigerias, the, the, the countries that never, ever really have a chance of going nuclear. So I think we should put that in perspective. I think tearing up the nuclear deal was a ridiculous thing to do, and obviously what we're seeing today doesn't bring us anywhere to denuclearization. I think, to be honest, denuclearization of North Korea is unrealistic. It's the only card the Koreans have to play, and they're not right. going to give it up. Yeah. So, David, just a little bit on the NPT, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear yes. Weapons. Um, would you forgive many countries for seeing it as a waste of time? Because you say it's asymmetric. It's the way, I guess, many countries see the Rome Statute when it comes to international justice and whether you can go to the ICC or not, right? So we look at the NPT. India, Pakistan, Israel didn't sign up. North Korea signed up and, and left. They pulled out. Was a country like Iran's biggest mistake that they signed up to it initially and allowed themselves to, inspect, to be inspected and all of that? Should they just stayed out of the game? Look, I, for my book, uh, which is uh, the, the, the first in English, at least, History and Analysis of the Nuclear Program from the beginning of the 1950s to the present day, I spoke to Akbar et Ahmad, who essentially came on board a few years after the, uh, the program's origins with uh, an Atoms for Peace reactor given. And he said, had he been in charge of the program, he never would have allowed or as far as he could, he would have advised that Iran never signed up to it. This is one thing we also have to remember as well. The Shah was one of the first signatories of the NPT. Iran was not coerced into signing the NPT. It did so willingly, and the Shah wanted Iran to stand as a model for other countries. And this anti-nuclear weapon stance is something that the Iranians claim has continued. Ayatollah Khomeini was said to have issued a fatwa against uh, the, the acquirement of nuclear weapons, which Ali Ashgar Soltanei, Iran's ambassador to the IEA, told me personally in, in Vienna, he told me this has been done, and Ayatollah Khamenei has reportedly issued a fatwa against nuclear weapons. So certainly Iran avowedly has no nuclear weapons ambitions. It did sign up willingly to the NPT, and the NPT benefits most the non-nuclear weapons. States. And I have to say, look, it has been remarkably successful. When the non-proliferation architecture first began with Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace process in the 1950s, the NPT has only seen one signatory go nuclear, and that is North Korea. Now, one, one signatory essentially withdrawing and going nuclear after almost half a century isn't too bad. If, I don't think many people in the right. 60s would have predicted that. Right. Mustafa Hoshesham, for those who make the distinction between a country like Iran and North Korea, they say, well, you know, Iran is clearly far more democratic and so forth. But they would also say, well, North Korea says many crazy things. It does those missile tests. It does those nuclear tests. But it's fundamentally a hermit kingdom, right? It doesn't have greater cultural or political designs on its neighbors and the region, whereas many Gulf states, the Americans, the Israelis, and others feel that Iran is almost a semi-imperial power, if not a fully-blown imperial power in the region. And that's one of the reasons why they have to be harsher on the Iranians vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons and ever getting that deterrent than even the North Koreans. Your response would be what? Well, um, I don't believe in that because uh, the United States is dealing with its enemies uh, almost the same. Uh, uh, it's, it's a strategy for, uh, you know, uh, if these rogue states or enemy states is uh, going through containment. Uh, when war is not an option, though uh, the threat of a war is present, in order to encourage the enemy states to come to the negotiating table, it's used as a, ca as a stick uh, along with the sanctions, uh, uh, then uh, the, the best uh, next option is intensifying sanctions in order to uh, push them towards negotiations. That's uh, the way the United States is dealing with its enemies. That's containment. And it's done with regard to Iran uh, and with regard to North Korea. Take a look at the uh, CATSA or the Countering uh, America's Adversary Sanctions Through Sanctions uh, Act. Uh, it mentions Iran, Russia, and North Korea all the same. There are different principles and rules applying to each, but uh, the framework is the same. Uh, it shows that the United States means to contain them first through sanctions and threat of military action, and then it tries to push back their power components one by one. Uh, the United States' strategy has always been what uh, George W. Bush said. You're either with us or against us. 
and for each state, uh, they will find their own excuses. Right. Now, when they were talking about North Korea first, they were speaking of its military nuclear capability. But little by little, we see that human rights issues and cyber attacks are bringing up to be put on the table. I don't know. They have not uh, yet defined what the, you know, what the contents of a deal could be, if it's a limited agreement or if it's a grand bargain. Uh, they have not uh, right. discussed the, br it, the yeah, breadth certainly. and the it depth it, and the I mean, mechanism. Right. It, and it doesn't, and it doesn't seem as if treaty, human rights, it does seem it as if human rights be have been sacrificed. Road. Certainly, it does seem as if human rights have been sacrificed. And, and I think it, it, it's worth mentioning the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea in 2014 spoke of evidence of extermination, murder, enslavement, torture, imprisonment, rape, forced abortions and other sexual violence, persecution on political, religious, racial and gender grounds, forcible transfer of populations, the enforced disappearance of persons and the inhumane act of knowingly causing prolonged starvation. It's nasty, right? That doesn't seem to have been discussed in Singapore. Maybe very little was discussed in Singapore. I want to move on slightly. And David, I know you wanted to jump in, so my apologies. I'll let you come in in a second. I want to ask Jim Walsh about Bolton's idea of the Libya model for North Korea. If you're a North Korean, you'd say, what? You want me to be like Gaddafi and be killed by my own people? You want me to give up my nu nukes and find my country a complete hellhole, which it became over the years after Gaddafi? Was that a stupid idea by Bolton? It may have been on purpose. It might have been. I, I can't believe that John Bolton is very happy with the last 48 hours. He's a neocon. He's argued for use of military force against Iran, against North Korea, against other countries. And this might have been, I mean, who knows? He might have said it on purpose in order to annoy the North Koreans and therefore to sort of derail this process. And it almost worked, except for the fact that uh, the summit was put on track after those letters. Uh, so, you know, I don't know what's in the head of John Bolton. I, I will say a couple of things, though. I do think the NPT has been very effective, far more effective than anyone could have ever predicted in uh, helping uh, reduce the spread of nuclear weapons. And I think also that, um, yes, uh, Iranians have a lot of uh, justifiable complaints, you know, going back to 1953 and the overflow, uh, overthrow of uh, their uh, elected prime minister. But I do think we have to make some distinction between Donald Trump as president and then sort of the United States in general. I mean, I, Obama did negotiate and sign the JCPOA. And Mr. Trump is the most unusual president in modern history. I mean, it's mind-blowing. Right. So I'm not sure we should necessarily define the United States as Donald Trump. Right. Uh, but I, I think we're, you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting to, to your point. Going forward, uh, do we have a situation where Secretary of State Pompeo is in a struggle with John Bolton for the president's attention uh, and, and favor? And I, I think we may be entering that phase. David, let me ask you a broad question, and you can fold in what you wanted to say into the sure. broad question. But fundamentally, when people hear that the United States, the UK, Russia, China, France, Israel, India, Pakistan, these countries deserve their nuclear weapons, they have their nuclear weapons, and that they are responsible nuclear weapons holders, and other countries are not. That is fundamentally rubbish, isn't it, David? Yeah, but that's not what the deal says. That's not what the bargain is. Now, in the, in the MPT, the nuclear powers are those that already had nuclear weapons. So that bell could not be unrung. So that was accepted. The second thing is that both India, Pakistan and Israel had to develop their programs clandestinely. And then essentially it was too late and they were, and they were discouraged from doing so at every point. The third point is, again, it, you know, you have to understand the people most invested, you know, it is not a question of the nuclear power strutting around with their capability saying, you don't deserve this, you don't deserve that. It is the tiny countries that don't have the capacity to ever go nuclear that are most invested in this. So it's not a question of deserving it. It's not a question of people, some people being responsible or not. Although I would add that no one, you know, apart from Pakistan, where there is uh, issues where some parts of the country, the tribal areas particularly, are almost, you know, a separate, you know, a separate entity. Uh, there hasn't been, you know, any real 
concern over the responsible or irresponsible use of nuclear weapons. Certainly not. Uh, I mean, the Arab states, for all their problems with Israel, have never, ever worried about Israel nuking them. Uh, look, I would want to return slightly to the current situation. Now, I have interviewed John Bolton, and he's personally an absolutely charming man, but suffers from the singular defect of being quite mad. <laughs> and especially when it comes to Iran, I mean, he's just itching to have a go at Iran. So what concerns me is, first of all, we've torn up a deal that was uh, an, you know, a very good deal. The, the common misconception you see between opponents of the deal is that, uh, you know, it was the choice between this deal and a better deal. It wasn't. It was a choice between this deal and no deal. So what concerns me is we have John Bolton, who, when I spoke to him, was, was pretty much itching to bomb Iran. We have Pompeo, who is also like that. My only hope is that Donald Trump's famously short attention span means that uh, that some of them will be fired within due course apparently he doesn't like moustaches so maybe Bolton's already on borrowed time the other point I was going to make was actually you have to make the distinction between America and Donald Trump which the point was already right. made Obama you could not say was a with us or against us person he very much from the first day of his inauguration outstretched his arms toward Iran okay very finally let me go back to Tehran Said Mustafa Hoshcheshim are Iranians more than ever in recent times preparing for war given the relationship with the United States right now and seeing what the US is doing elsewhere which seems like a bit of a double standard vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians well uh, before uh, I answer your question I'd like to express my view that uh, Donald Trump uh, is not a separate man from the US establishment uh, he has been able to beat uh, his rivals but uh, uh, Mr. Obama, the former president who struck the deal with Iran, uh, the violation of the JCPOA started when he was in office. We remember the visa change, uh, waiver program that was changed uh, then. And uh, they promised, John Kerry specifically promised Iran's Zarif that they would do something about it, but they never took any action. I saw the Iran Sanctions Act was reimposed again. Uh, against Iran, and that was also in violation of the agreements that they had, and uh, it was all under President okay. Obama. It was under President Obama okay, that foreign you feel banks Trump was were a continuation intimidated of Obama. from, Fair okay. you know, doing business with Iran. But res in response, in response to your question, uh, no, uh, we believe that the United States is not in a position to launch war against Iran. But uh, yes, Iran is preparing to withdraw from the JCPOA if, you, uh, if that's uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the exact point that you want to, you know, uh, uh, you want its answer. Uh, uh, Iran uh, has given the Europeans enough time so far uh, to comply with their undertakings and provide it with, need, with the needed insurances that they would, uh, you know, uh, uh, guarantee Iran's continued economic merits under the deal. But uh, nothing, not more than one or two weeks are left uh, from the deadline that has been specified here in Tehran. And uh, if the Europeans, uh, uh, you know, fail to uh, guarantee Iran's continued merit, that seems to be the case now. Uh, Iran would declare its withdrawal from the JCPOA, okay. irrespective of any kind of consequences that might be posed. Okay, gentlemen, I've got to wrap. But it's fascinating because the Singapore summit uh, sheds new light on not only the U.S. and North Korea and South Korea and so forth, but it, uh, it gets us to reinterpret and relook at so many other things, U.S. and Iran, the future of nukes, who should have weapons and not. And I'm glad we could sort of straddle a lot of those fields during this discussion. It's been a pleasure having you all on the Newsmakers. Jim Walsh, Thank you very David much. Patrick Karakos, and Mustafa Hosh Cheshen. Thanks again.